came for prayer. No matter where he was, whether it was on the street corner or in the middle of the street even, he would immediately stop and perform his prayer. He lived to be over a hundred years old and was still listed in the 1820 American census. Perhaps more famous though was Kunte Kinte, immortalized in Alex Haley's book, Roots. Kunte Kinte was a member of the Mandinka tribe of West Africa. He was born around 1750 in Jafur, a village along the Gambia River in West Africa. He was educated in Quran and Arabic as a child in the local village school. At age 16, Kunte left the village to go out into the jungle to find some wood to make a drum. And at that point, he was captured by slave traders, taken to the coast and transported to America on the Lord Ligonier. He arrived in Annapolis, Maryland on September 29, 1767. To give you an idea of the horrors of what is called the Middle Passage, the journey from Africa to the Americas that the slaves had to endure. On Conte Kente's ship, 30% of the enslaved Africans died during that crossing of the Atlantic, 30%. Well, now that he's in America, Conte Kente was sold at auction to John Waller of Spotsylvania County, Virginia, and was given the slave name of Toby. Conte, however, was a proud person, and he didn't take to slavery very easily, and he repeatedly attempted to escape, being caught each time. Finally, after his last attempt to escape, in order to keep him from running away again, his owner amputated his foot. He was then sold to Dr. William Waller on September 6, 1768. He later married and fathered one child, a daughter, Kizzy. We know that Kunte Kinte continued his prayers throughout slavery and that he taught the basics of Islam to his daughter. However, his daughter was then sold away to another slave owner and was raped by that new slave owner, giving birth to a son who's known as Chicken George. Photos of Chicken George taken late in his life as an old man show him wearing a thobe and a kufi. The Islam of Kunte Kinte, despite the horrors and hardships of slavery, had managed to survive to his grandson. We Muslims also fought to secure American independence from Great Britain in the American Revolutionary War. Consider the case of Yusuf bin Ali, also known as Joseph bin Hali, who was a Muslim from Arab stock in 18th century Africa. He was found wandering in the American wilderness by General Thomas Sumner shortly before the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. And when that war began, Yusuf was one of the very first to volunteer for General Sumner's brigade. Throughout the entire length of the Revolutionary War, Yusuf served as a scout for Sumner's brigade and later settled down in Sumner County, South Carolina. Yes, we Muslims fought to gain American independence in the first place. And a few years later, we stood armed and ready to defend the American coastline from British invasion in the War of 1812. Consider the case of Bilali Muhammad, a Muslim from the Fulbe tribe of Timbo in Guinea, West Africa. Muhammad was educated in Arabic and Quranic studies in West Africa and may well have been in training to become an imam. Around 1802, he landed in Georgia as an enslaved African, and he was purchased by Thomas Spaulding of Sapello Island, Georgia. Now, Bilali must have been an extraordinary man. Within the hierarchy of slavery in the American South, there weren't very many steps. You know, the lowest rung on the totem pole was working out in the fields. This was hard, back-breaking work, and around 1800, the average life expectancy of a slave working in the fields was only 15 years. 
people were literally worked to death. Somewhat higher up in the slave hierarchy might be tending the master's garden, etc., and still a little higher up being a household servant. You had much better food, much better chance of continuing to live in these occupations. But this was usually it. But not for Balali. Balali was so exceptional that he actually became the overseer of the entire plantation. Usually this was a uh, someone who was a white, but here was an enslaved African who was the overseer of the entire plantation. And Spalding was so impressed with Bilali that we are told he did something quite unusual. He actually went to the trouble of going out and finding a copy of the Quran which he purchased and gave to Bilali. And he also allowed Bilali to build a small mosque on the plantation. Apparently the first mosque built in the United States of America sometime in the first two decades of the 19th century. Well, when the War of 1812 broke out, the British threatened to invade Sapello Island, Georgia, and they promised freedom to any slave who would rise up in rebellion against his owner. That, that's quite a carrot to hold out in front of someone. Well, Spalding and his family prepared to flee from the threatened British invasion to leave the island, but before he fled, he called Bilali into him and asked him to organize the slaves to defend the island and Spalding's property. Bilali said that he could make no promises for Spalding's non-Muslim slaves, but he promised that every Muslim slave would fight to the death to preserve Spalding's property. So impressed was Spalding with Bilali, that he actually went to the extent of arming Bilali and his fellow Muslim slaves with 80 muskets. To my knowledge, the only time in American history in which a slave owner dared to give guns to his slaves. This is how exceptional the character of Bilali Muhammad was. His word was his bond. Some decades later, we Muslims fought in the American Civil War to preserve the Union. Consider the case of Muhammad Ali ibn Sayyid, who was born around the year 1833 in what is today Nigeria. He was educated as a child in Arabic, Quranic studies, and Turkish. At age 16, he was captured and enslaved, and then was repeatedly sold and resold many times both in Africa and the Middle East. Eventually, he became the slave of a wealthy Russian. And with that Russian, he traveled throughout Russia, Persia, Georgia, Poland, Austria, Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, Italy, France, and England. So quite a world tour. Finally, in England in the year 1859, the Russian emancipated. Muhammad gave him his freedom. And at that point, Muhammad traveled to the Americas as the paid servant of a Dutchman, and for the next two years, traveled throughout the Caribbean, Canada, and the Eastern United States. In 1862, Muhammad crossed the border from Canada to Michigan and became a school teacher in Detroit, Michigan. One year later, in 1863, Muhammad enlisted in Company I of the 55th Regiment of the Massachusetts Colored Volunteers and fought in the Union Army in such battles as those at Fort Mims and Honey Hill in 1864 and at James Island and Biggin Creek, South Carolina in 1865. He must have been quite a soldier too because he rose from the rank of private to sergeant in just his first two months in the Union Army. He left the military in 1865 with the close of the war and his autobiography was actually published in Atlantic Monthly, at that point perhaps the most prestigious magazine in America, and that publication was in the year 1867. 
Muhammad died in Brownsville, Tennessee.